Nanir said she would wait in her room for the Corloys to make contact, so Asana, Kismel, and Argo and I left the hotel room on the third floor of the casino. We walked down the extravagant staircase onto the ground floor and crossed directly towards the entrance, where Argo theatrically clutched her stomach and wailed, Oh, I'm so hungry! We gotta get something to eat! Agreed, said Asana. That's a good idea, added Kismel. Nanir had instructed us to return before the end of the day time arena matches, but we probably had time to eat, I supposed. Argo, however, lowered her head to gaze up at me and asked, What's up, key boy? Aren't you hungry? I took a step back and replied, No, I am hungry, but... I had a sandwich at the casino after we split up this morning. You traitor! L look, you guys were enjoying the bath, I protested, glancing at Asana. Didn't you eat anything after you got out? Not a bite. In fact, we were just taking a breather after getting out of the bath when you sent your message, so we didn't have time to eat, or even if we wanted to. Oh, uh, sorry about that. Well, let's go grab a bite then, I urged, until I remembered that her party had an extra member now. Asana and Argo and I would enjoy just about anything, of course, but I still didn't know much about a, a dark elf's typical diet. During our time at Yofel and Galley Castles, the food they served us was healthy with plenty of vegetables, and the only animal protein I got was a grilled whitefish and poultry. Surely she would eat other things than that, though. Um, Kismel, is there anything you'd rather avoid? Or actually, what do you like? I asked. The knight inclined her head as she considered. Hmm, I do not consider myself a picky eater, but if I had to give you an answer... I'd say I do not much like rare meat dripping with blood and fat, or dishes with strong spices. Or Narso's fruit, huh? I teased with a grin. She shot me a smug look and quipped back, No, but that is medicinal. You do not eat it for the taste. No kidding. Okay, so we're avoiding steaks and kebabs. Any recommendations outside of those, Argo? Hmm, let's see, Argo murmured, her whisker-painted cheeks puckering briefly. She snapped her finger. That's it! I know where we'll go. Where's that? You'll have to look forward to the surprise! Argo's surprises could be total bullseyes, or they could be too avant-garde for their own good so I wasn't sure how to feel about this development. Ultimately, I just had to hope it would be the former. Well, lead the way. That's the spirit! Follow me! She said, marching off. Asana and Kismil and I followed her in order. It was like a good old-school 2D pixel RPG, the four of us walking in a line down a side street that headed into the southwest block of Volupta. Normally, the streets in this town were supposed to be aligned in the four cardinal directions, if not quite as precisely as in Stachin. But because of the chaotic ways the buildings themselves bulged and lean, the alleys actually twisted left and right as, as it went. Decaying barrels and boxes and such were strewn about the alley. And the paving stones were cracked here and there, which pushed this area over the line of working class into slums. If you weren't careful, it looked like you could get held up at gunpoint at any moment. It almost made me paranoid that Argo knew our elite NPC member would help us clear up a few stray quests for her. But then we came to a stop. Here we are, Argo said. On the left side of the alley was a building that smelled of food, with an aged iron sign hanging on the door. The design of it was a pointed leaf, 
almost like the one on the Canadian flag. At a glance, it looked more like a herb cellar than a restaurant. Since our guest of honor was not familiar with human cooking, I figured ungratefully that if we were going to stretch her boundaries, we could just go back to pots and pots again. But Argo was already pushing the faded wooden door open. A deep voice greeted us as soon as the tinkling doorbell announced our entrance. Asana and Kismil followed Argo through the entrance, so I brought up the rear. On the inside, the place was cramped and built to look like a grotto, but it went back much farther than pots and pots, which was just a counter. At the very end, there was a four-seat table. On the left side was a counter that could seat about five people, behind which stood a figure like a small mountain. This would be the man who welcomed us in, and he was both taller and wider than Agile. My first thought was that he could be an ogre trying to pass himself off as human. But the women headed straight for the table without any sign of intimidation, so I had to hurry after them. Austin and Kismel took the far seats, leaving Argo and me to sit next to each other. There were two ancient-looking menus resting on the shining black table surface. The reddish-brown front cover had the name written in a simple style. Minons. That would presumably be the owner's name, but I was having trouble associating the cute writing with the muscular, towering man behind the counter. Uh... Who's a Minon? I whispered. Argo jabbed a thumb at the counter to the left. My instincts to peek were too strong for me to ignore the voice in my head saying, Don't look! Perhaps the lamp hanging from the ceiling over the counter was too low because he just looked like a massive shadow. But there was no one else back there, so that man had to be Minon. I decided that I had to get over the stubborn idea that a menacing man must have a menacing name. To me, Minon sounded rather cute, and turned back to the table and the menu. There were only two pages. On the left, it said simply, Dolma, 20 coal, and Musica, 30 coal, and on the right, Ozu, 10 coal, and Coffee, Five coal, in rough script. I checked the back cover, just in case, but it was blank. After the hundred plus varieties of bread bowl stews and pots and pots, the limited options here were stifling. But more importantly, um, Argo, I have no idea what any of these are, aside from the coffee. What are Dalma and Masaka and Ozo? I asked, doing my best to pronounce the unfamiliar words. The information agent stifled a chuckle. That's exactly the reaction I was counting on, Keyboy. What? I I'm sure Austin is thinking the same thing, I argued, but the other side of the table, my temporary partner, was also grinning widely at my ignorance. I'm sorry, Kirito. I know what these are. You got Dolma, right? But the other ones are Musaka and Uzo. I'm guessing that means you know what these dishes are. Of course. It's the perfect menu for this town in particular. Good choice, Argo. You bet it is. And my tip about this place is on the house, my friends. Their smug superiority was making me feel a bit sulky. I looked at Austin as seating partner and asked... Do you know what Dolma and Musica are too, Kismel? No, I have never seen them, said the knight, shaking her head. But since I am here in this human town, I would enjoy the chance to eat a new kind of dish. I'm looking forward to these delicacies. Oh, uh, okay. Kismel's beaming smile was so brilliant, I had to shield my eyes from her radiance. Argo stifled another chuckle in her throat and snapped the menu shut. Well, since there ain't much room to choose, I'll just do the ordering. Hey boss, we'll have four dolmas, four musicas, and four uzos. 
You got it, said the deep voice from the counter. After ten seconds of clanking tools and knives, I started to smell a delectable scent. Um, maybe this will be tasty after all, I thought. Then a voice said, Hey, buddy. Yes, I answered automatically, but I was the only one at the table who could possibly be referring to as buddy. Thankfully, the huge cook had not read my mind. He said apologetically, Would you mind carrying this stuff to the table? I run this place all on my own, so I don't have anyone to serve you. Uh, of course, I'd be happy to, I said, getting to my feet. When I approached his enormous hands, set down a ceramic bottle, a pitcher of water, and four wine glasses. After careful consideration, I cradled the bottle in my left arm, the pitcher in my right, and gingerly held two glasses in each hand, then carried them over to the table. The moment everything was safely on top of the table, I'd let go. Asana clucked. You could have just brought them over in two or three trips. What if you got tripped up and dropped them? Well, I didn't. Yes, but you could have. Well, if you're going to blame me for things that didn't happen, then... Uh, I tried and failed to think of what antonym for all's well that ends well would be, and burst out of laughter erupted from the counter. You got style, buddy. Carrying all that over in one go? Try this next. What? Again? I complained, thinking that this was rather abusive restaurant towards its customers. Back at the counter, there were four steaming dishes in one basket of cutlery. The plates each had a mysterious dark green object covered in a milky white sauce, which I found very intriguing, but I had my pride to live up to. I ran a mental simulation. Then made full use of my left fingers to hold two plates. I carefully placed another one on my forearm, so I had three on one arm. The rest was easy. Three fingers on my right hand held the last plate, and I hooked the cutlerly basket with my pinky. Then I turned back to the table and put them all down in reverse order. There, see? See what? I'm telling you, that's not going to end well. Then you could get up and help me, Asana. Then you could ask me for help. Once again, the cook interrupted our argument. Hey, buddy, here's the last one. All right. I turned back, excited to see what was next. On the counter were four sizzling gratin dishes. Ugh. <sighs> I swallowed and considered this development gravely, even ignoring the sizzling heat of the gratin dishes. They were lipped in a way that rose vertically around the edge, which made it impossible to hold two in one hand with different fingers. I could hold one with my left hand and place another on my arm, but then I couldn't do the same on the other side with only one open hand. I just got to lift it with sheer willpower, I told myself. Honing my mind, but I could not psychically lift the dish. Swearing to myself that I'd learn the psychokinesis skill one day, I turned back to Asana and said, I'm sorry, please help me. You should have just started with that, she said, rolling her eyes. Asana stood up and promptly pushed down Kismel, who tried to rise with her. Argo did not budge from her seat before coming to the counter. We each took two dishes and carried them to the table. Now we had the mystery dolmas, moussakas, and ozos for each person. The only thing I'd learned so far was that ozos was a beverage. Well, shall we share a toast? Argo picked up the ceramic bottle and poured two fingers of, a, of liquid into each of our wine glasses. Then she added the same amount of water from the pitcher, instantly turning the clear liquid cloudy and white. It reminded me of the dye being washed out of the lichen's fur. So I asked her quietly, 
Uh, this is safe to drink, right? Yeah, no worries, she said, which was not all that reassuring. She passed out the wa- the glasses, and I lifted mine with trepidation. To meeting Kismel, Argo announced. We clinked glasses. I took a little sip of the cloudy liquid. Immediately, a powerful herbal scent stung my nose, and the alcohol burned my throat. If it was this harsh when cut with water, how strong was the liquid straight from the bottle? I grimaced and looked across the table, where Asuna's brows were slightly knit. Kismel looked totally unaffected. She drank it down in one go and placed her glass on the table. Ah, this drink is good. It uses a good variety of herbs and plants. I figured an elf would like it, Argo replied. I wanted to ask, really, you did? But if Kismel was happy, that was all that mattered. I promptly poured another drink of Ozo's in the knight's glass. I was about to pour in the water, but she requested a little less. So I gave her half as much water as alcohol. Somehow, I managed to finish my own Uzo's, then placed my glass on the edge of the table to make it clear I didn't need more. Instead, I picked up my knife and fork to try out the food. The small round plate featured two elliptical dark green objects slathered in milky white sauce. Whatever they were, they seemed to be steamed inside of a large leaves. The exterior reminded me of kashiwa mochi, rice cakes wrapped up in an oak leaf. Based on that, I assumed you were supposed to peel the leaf off without eating it, but the whole thing was wrapped so tightly that I couldn't tell where I was supposed to start removing it. At this point, I decided to copy Asuna and Argo and snuck a quick glance at them. But both were sipping on their ouzos and watching my hands very carefully. Not because they were ignorant of how to eat this, but because they wanted to watch my attempt. Fine, you want to laugh at me? Go ahead. I stabbed my fork into one of the elliptical things, then lifted it into my mouth and bit down. The leaf split with a nice crispy texture, and as I chewed, the texture churned much thicker. The inside was probably rice and meat. It was kind of like a western style sticky rice dumpling, but with a lemony cream sauce that matched the flavor and a fun crispy leaf texture on the outside. I popped the other half on my fork into my mouth and said, it's good. Of course, replied Argo, stabbing one of her western dumplings with a with her fork and taking a bite. Austin and Kismel politely cut into pieces with her with a knife at first. I finished off other the other dumplings quickly, then pulled my glass back towards me and poured a bit of the ouzo. I added extra water and gave it a taste. At a more diluted level like this, the eccentric flavor and scent didn't bother me so much. In fact, it was kind of refreshing. At this point, I wanted to get right into the gratin, but it seemed politer to wait for the others. For whatever reason, Asuna started to unroll the leaf on her second dumpling. Using her fork and knife, she carefully peeled off the leaf and laid it on top of the plate. Look. Look at what? Oh! The leaf, which was a bit larger than my palm, had jagged edges and two large clefts, much like the Canadian flag, the same shape as what on what was on the iron sign on the door. So, the sign outside was this leaf? Maple leaf? Bzz, it looks like it, though. No, this is a grape leaf. Oh, I murmured, as Kismel said, Ah, there are vineyards on the ninth floor, but I did not know the leaves could be used for cooking. Which was this? The dolma or... The Mosuka. Dolma, said Asana at once. Then she added, less decisively, I'm pretty sure it means stuffed. Based on the way she said it, 
I had to assume that these dolmas and probably the masukas and uzo too were real world dishes, just like the cow mangai from Lectio, but I couldn't begin to guess which country they were from. Hmm, interesting. Seems more wrapped to me, but anyway, it's good. I'm looking forward to the musuka as well, said Kismel, pulling the rectangular gratin dish toward her. I followed her lead. The material must have been very good in at insulation, because the outside surface was only warm, but the contents were still bubbling and steaming. It wasn't exactly cool inside the restaurant, so it was kind of a dish I'd prefer to eat in the winter floors. Still, the way the heaping white sauce browed up was boosting my appetite. It might be the first gratin I'd had so far in Eincrad. I thought Argo passed over the cutlery basket, so I pulled out a spoon with the with a flat end and scooped up a bite from the very bottom of the dish. Beneath the sauce, it was neither rice nor macaroni, but layers of ground meat, mashed potatoes, and sliced eggplant. After blowing on the spoonful, I stuffed it into my mouth. Oh, mm, it, it's good. It was like a scene from a comic book, but of course, it was good. Tomato-flavored ground meat, steaming potatoes, and soft eggplant mixed with rice and white sauce? It was a perfect mixture, and the flavor was so satisfying, it was hard to believe this was virtual food in a virtual world. Asana and Kismel moved their spoons in silence, as did Argo, who had presumably tried this dish before. In just two or three minutes... We all had emptied our servings. A little swig of ouzo cooled down my overheated mouth and tongue, and I wrapped the glass down on the table. We'd eaten delicious food all over on the seventh floor, and the dolma and mosuka together might have been the most satisfying yet. The gruff excuse for customer service here was a small price to pay for a flavor like this. Kismel was just as satisfied as I was. She finished off her glass of ouzo, which had barely any water in it, and exhaled, Ah, both food and drink were very good. Asana, what does musica mean? Um, from what I remember, it's like something juicy or something chilled. Huh? What? Argo and I craned our necks in the same direction. It was served in an oven-baked dish so hot it could burn your tongue. That name couldn't be any less accurate. Asana looked our way and pursed her lips with frustration. Look, it's not like I have an entire dictionary in my brain, but I'm pretty sure that in the place where Musica was first developed... It was a chilled appetizer. Then in green, in a different area, it turned into a hot dish. Ah, uh, yes, such things do happen, Kismil agreed. In Lysula, we have a dish called Panakorkel that came over from Kelo. It is a, like a lightly cooked pancake. While the forest elves eat theirs with only a sprinkle of sugar and cinnamon, we dark elves prefer a healthy serving of jam and cream on top. I hardly think I need to point out which is tastier. The sol sight of her culinary pride made me smile. I promptly commented, That sounds very good indeed. I'd like to eat it someday. Of course, when you come to the city on the ninth floor, you can eat all that you like. Kismo replied generously, but her smile did not last long, presumably remembering her personal situation. After escaping from the cells of Harin Tree Palace, Kismo could not return to the castle on the ninth floor, or any other strongholds, unless she brought back the four sacred keys with her. At the moment, 
My proposal to track the fallen elves was our only hope, but we didn't even know that all four keys would be kept at the fallen's base, should we succeed. And if Kaisara, the ransacker, happened to be there, we would be wiped out at our current strength. On top of that, we didn't even know how the fallen were traveling from floor to floor, given that they couldn't use the spirit trees. Until we solved that mystery, another attack from Kaisara would always be possible, even if we took the keys back. I sighed, thinking about the challenges ahead of us. Asana put a hand on Kismel's back and said, It's all right. My premonitions always come true. We're going to get the sacred keys back. Yes, of, of course we are, she replied, smiling again. She poured back the last of the ouzo in her glass and turned to the other person at the table. Thank you for bringing me to this wonderful place, Argo. Glad you liked it, but you ought to thank Keyboy instead. Huh? Why me? It didn't seem like carrying the dishes to the table is worthy of such a display of gratitude. But before I could say as much, Argo flashed a smirk at me. Because Keyboy's paying for the meal, obviously. It wasn't until recently that I learned that the timing for payment at NPC restaurants depend on the establishment. Most places would bring up a small payment window upon each individual's order, which would subtract the required coal when you hit the OK button. If you didn't pay, the food would not appear, no matter how many hours you waited. In other words, you paid separately and up front. But in a fancy restaurant that weren't my style, in some tiny locations, an individual could pay the entire bill after the meal. In the case of the former, it was to avoid ruining the atmosphere with a cheap demand for payment. And in the latter, I suspect it was to tempt the player with an eat-and-run challenge. From what I'd heard, there were bold players who ate all they could, then sprinted out of the building and succeeded in escaping both the cook and guards, thus enjoying a free meal without suffering the cost of a prison stay in Black Iron Palace. Of course, I did not run out on the bill. I thanked Minon for the meal, then paid the cost of 420 coal for the four of us. For excellent food and alcohol to boot, the price was quite reasonable. But if Argo chose this place specifically because she knew she could force the bill onto me, I had to give her a piece of my mind. I headed out the door, resolute only to be met by the three women outside, smiling and saying, Thanks for the meal. Thanks for the meal. Thanks for the meal. I made a face like I'd been sucking on a lemon for ten years. Um, you're quite welcome. Well, shall we get going? Said Argo, back in her usual mode. And she turned and strolled north down the street before I could give her any lip. Kismel followed her after her. And I lined up next to Asana in the back. So, which country are Dolmas and Musakas from? I whispered, after we'd gotten at the end of the building. Just as quietly, she replied, Greece. Ah, just like how Volupta reminded you of Sa... Saturini? Yes. Interesting. So that's why you said that it was a perfect meal to have in a town like this, I remarked watching Argo's back as she took the lead. It seemed that the rat hadn't chosen that restaurant to make me pay for it, but it was because she understood that the style of Volupta was reminiscent of the islands of Santorini, and that the dolmas and moussakas were Greek food. Asana was quite the source of real-world information and customs, but Argo seemed to have all of that on top of a vast knowledge of Einkrad and the systems of SAO. I couldn't really tell what her age was. She seemed to be our age, but she also called herself Big Sis a lot. So she could be older. Where had she gotten this encyclopedia of knowledge and experience? 
And why did she pursue the job of selling information in this deadly game, an act that was in some way more dangerous than being a player trying to beat the game? Of course, if you're that curious about something, it's best to just ask directly. But that wouldn't work with Argo. I could just see her smirking and saying something like, That'll be 10,000 coal, bub. If I ever owned 10 million coal, I told myself that I'd buy every last personal fact that Argo sold about herself. I was pretty sure I'd, I'd made that decision before. The side street took us back to the open space in front of the casino. It was about 10 minutes after 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The final battle of the daytime monster arena was scheduled for 4.30, so we still had time to get back to Ninir's room. But I was also worried that, about the possibility that the ALS and the DKB might be attempting to double their chips with each battle to get 100,000. Argo must have been thinking the same thing, because she leaned in and said under her breath, I'm going to go check on the monster coliseum. You go back to Lady Nier first. It's not like I'll have any role in the inspection of the stables. Sure, if you say so. But you're the one who accepted the quest from her, right? Sure you shouldn't be with us? Since forming my temporary partnership with Asana, we had almost never worked separately, so my knowledge of how quests and parties interacted wasn't all that solid. Argo just tilted her head, though, and said, No worries. If we're in a party, we'll share quest status. Just make sure you don't accidentally kick me out. Got it. Just shoot me a message when you're done with the inspection. Argo headed off, so I rejoined Asana and Kismel, who were chatting and looking around the plaza. After a few words, we walked towards the casino. The pure white building was glowing golden in the slanted sunlight. Since coming to Volupta, Asana and I had spent about 24 hours in and around the city. It was on the southern edge of the floor, so in terms of symbol distance, we had crossed half the floor so far. But the tailwind road that connected the main town of Volupta was a long, plain road with no dungeon or bosses along the route. But the route to Premio, the northwest of here, and the route from Premio to the Labyrinth Tower was full of challenges. In terms of the actual work to conquer the floor, we're 30% of the way through the at best. Of course, if either the ALS or DKB gained the completely game-breaking Sword of Volupta, the pace of our advancement might speed up significantly. However, they were relying on cheat sheets to win that were certainly a trap created by the Corloys to sucker high rollers into losing big money. Still, if Cabal and Lind were sharp enough to detect the trap and bet on the opposite card in the final match of the night, but maybe the Corloys had a plan in place for that too. In the end, they were just an individual facet of a massive SAO game system. And unlike the real world, with its immutable laws of physics, Eincred was a virtual place where f the system could do anything it wanted if it had the reason to. Much like the pattern with the color of the roulette dealer's bow tie and the odds of landing on that color. Maybe the seventh floor is going to take a lot longer than I'm thinking, I wondered. Suddenly, Asuna was at my side and prodding my elbow. Come on, let's go back to Lady Ninir. Right. Are you full now, Kismel? I asked, without thinking much. The knight narrowed her eyes, with part exasperation, part out of rage. I am fine. Kirito, how much of a glutton do you take me for? I was just checking. Shall we go back? I did a 90 degree turn to the left and quickly marched off towards the center entrance of the Grand Casino. Behind my back, I heard the women quietly giggling.